that went out on our street. Somebody cut a line and who knows what, what happened there. But, um, but with that, I'm going, we have two shorter presentations, not, not um, I mean, not, they're not speed talks. So they're actually longer than a speed talk, but shorter than the, the earlier presentations we have. And so these are from uh, both the personnel from the Centroid, um, Sophia Lynn and um, Beth Tulinowski. Uh, Sophia is gonna talk uh, about Geo for Good and uh, Beth is gonna talk about story maps. And with that, um, Sophia, I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Melinda. Let's see if I can get this on and functioning. All right, you seeing my screen? <laughs> Yes, and now present. All right, does it look good? I can't, uh, can somebody verbally tell me? <laughs> can you Looks see the great. screen? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so happy GIS day or post GIS day as it were. Um, the Geo for Good Summit is an annual conference geared towards nonprofits, scientists and other change makers who want to leverage mapping tools and technology for positive impact in the world. The summit is an opportunity to hear the latest updates about Google's mapping technologies, and also to learn about others in the community who are using these technologies for impact. This year it took place at the end of October, and of course it was virtual. This is the ninth year that they've had it, um, but uh, the first time that they've been able to attract and bring in so many people because obviously they didn't have to bring 1600 people in. So I believe it's safe to say that many of us have a love-hate relationship with Google. Google provides us with so much, access to so much. Um, it's revolutionized everything that we do, not only in the mapping realm, but in our communications and so many other, other things. And yet it has some questionable business practices and it is rather dominant. So in preparing for this talk, I thought, what, what happens if you Google Google? What, what would come up? Well, lots of things come up and a few highlights. Google.com is the most visited website worldwide. It was the most valuable brand in the world in 2017. Um, it's been overtaken by Amazon lately. Um, and Google has indeed received plenty of criticism involving issues such as privacy concerns, tax avoidance, antitrust, censorship, search neutrality, et cetera, et cetera. And they are, as I mentioned, so dominant in so many fields. They've got their fingers in everything. In fact, on this page, on this very slide, Google is mentioned 26 times. Okay, so let's see what we can say. What is good about Google? If you don't mind, for the next 10 or 15 minutes, let's suspend our criticisms and suspicions and consider the potential that Google has for doing good. All right, fundamentally, Google's got resources. Google has data, computational power, tools, reach. As Dave just shared in his presentation, some of the things that he's able to do now would, would have been impossible without the power of Google Earth engine without the power of the cloud systems that they have and the servers. Also with 119,000 employees around the world, they have an incredible resource, human resources, and many of those individuals truly want to do good. For our purposes, Google also has geospatial information. Google Maps, Google Earth, we're all familiar with, but they also have location tracking information that indeed is proprietary, but they can make that shareable and available to others. So as I mentioned before, let's suspend our criticisms and let's think about how we can do some good. So Geo for Good, as I mentioned, um, this year had over 1,600 virtual attendees from 100 countries. It was two days of presentations, including uh, the first day was pretty much presentations by Google about what they are doing. And then that was followed by lightning talks from other people around the world and networking. And I wanna say that in just in these few minutes that I'll be speaking to you today, I'm just gonna highlight a few of the, um, of the activities that Google is doing. And then if we have time, I'll show a very short video about the community. 
but I really encourage you to go to uh, Google Earth Outreach and you can see all of the recorded videos and they'll be able to explain to you, you know, far more in depth what Google is doing and also what the greater community is doing. So the three elements that I, or the three um, initiatives that I'll highlight today um, are ones that I believe um, I want to talk about because of their potential for actionable impact at the local level. So as we're talking about Google having a global reach and they have data at that, at that scale too, um, these uh, initiatives that I'm going to talk about are ones that can take that, um, that global data and bring it down to some sort of actionable um, activities at the very local level where we know that that's where it matters. So the three, the three projects I'll talk about are Plus, Clo Plus Codes, Environmental Insights Explorer, and then a Dynamic World, which is coming out. And then again, if we have time, uh, we'll spend, uh, we can watch a short video about the community. So plus codes, all right. So um, many of us take uh, physical addresses for granted. Um, and plus codes is Google's uh, response to, to providing a locational um, identifier for every, place on um, the on the, the globe. So many of you may have been familiar with What Three Words. Um, what Three Words was a very novel um, initiative, I guess, when it came out a number of years ago. I remember being blown away when I first heard about it because we had always thought coordinate systems finding where you are on the planet was all, you know, it's latitude and longitude, it's UTM, it's those numbers. And, and here these guys were saying, they divided the whole world into three by three meter grid squares. And for every one of those grid squares, they assigned three words. And that was a unique identifier for a place on the, on the planet. Really fascinating approach. So plus codes, um, I just learned about this year, uh, or just last month, um, is Google's response to doing this. So instead of using three words, it's doing a similar kind of thing where it's dividing the whole planet into grids, um, excuse me, generally based on latitude and longitude, and then refining down and down to smaller and smaller grids so that you can have a coded identifier up to like 10 digits. Um, that it's like a four digit code and then a plus code and then it gets more and more detailed um, after the plus. And so it's uh, a, a very easy way to give a location identifier to anywhere on the planet. So this is important. Um, so what you can see on this slide on the right is uh, our plus code for where this, the new Centroid office is. It's generated within Google Maps. Um, it can be used offline and it is uh, open source. Um, the algorithm was developed within um, Google Maps, but it can be used offline. Um, I do want to mention how and, uh, and why this is helpful and how it's been used so far. So again, these stories are available on, um, on the Google Outreach, web Outreach website. But in Calcutta, um, they were able to actually put some signage on people's houses with these unique identifiers. And that means that people can begin to receive mail, packages, utility, emergency services. Um, it also gives people um, to verify their identity so that they can open bank accounts, register to vote, and secure access to social services. So these three um, images, just snapshot right off of Google's website, um, are just examples of how it's already being used. Oh, one thing I also wanted to mention is that yes, these are used for people, but they also can be used for um, non-people. You know, like say you're doing a research project in the middle of Mongolia. Yes, you can use lat long location too, but this is just another approach where you can you can provide a, a specific location to, to anywhere on the planet. All right, the second, um, the second project that uh, we'll talk about is um, what they call Environmental Insights Explorer, or EIE. And um, this one is focusing on cities around the world. So Melinda, very appropriate for some of the work that you've been doing. And, what they've discovered, or not discovered, but what they're trying to react to is the fact that 70% of emissions um, come from cities and cities occupy only about 2% of land area. And so if they are gonna try to have a positive impact on climate action, 
um, this would be an ideal way to start. And one of the uh, issues that local cities have is that they don't have access to baseline data. They don't even know what kind of emissions they, they have, even if they want to commit to reducing their emissions, they need to have some baseline information. So Environmental Insights Explorer is a reaction to that. And the things that they're focusing on particularly are um, transportation emissions, building emissions, and the potential for rooftop solar. So they have data presently for, I think, 3,000 cities, but they're focusing more specifically on 500 cities around the world. And um, it's, it's really, I think, pretty amazing what, what they're able to do. So transportation emissions, what they are able to do with their location data, because you know they're able to, to collect you know, where we are using our, our cell phones, they're able to build up algorithms that are, that are pretty intense, that are able to look at the speed that somebody is moving and then to be able to ascertain what kind of transportation method that is possibly happening. And then they can do some additional um, crunching and computations to say, okay, well, if this person is moving at this speed, it's likely they're on a bike and, it, and so their emissions will be X. Or they're traveling at this speed, they're on a train, so the emissions would be Y. And so they're able to do with this, this for multiple modes of transportation in and out of cities. They're able to see whether um, travel is happening within a city or if people are coming from outside or within. So um, I thought that commuting data that, that Matt showed earlier was quite fascinating in the realm of this too. But, but what they're able to do is provide this dashboard then for any city to be able to do some scenario planning and to actually look at real time data. So um, the second one, so that was transportation emissions. The second one is building emissions. And um, once again, with the access they have to incredible data, including Google Street View, they're able to not only see a building footprint, but to be able to estimate the heights of buildings. Uh, so you know how many floors. And then with their Google business data, they're also able to see, is this likely to be a residence or is it a business? If it's a business or perhaps a hospital or perhaps a school, they can better estimate what kind of building emissions would probably be happening based on the type of building it is. Once again, powerful tools for planners who are trying to make a difference in their emissions. And then the third one um, is rooftop solar potential. So once again, looking at incredible amounts of data, doing some an, further analyses on, um, on every pixel. Um, they can look at not only uh, the size of a roof, but its, um, its aspect, its orientation, and then they can even bring in potential cloud cover data so they know like, what's, what's the likelihood that there's gonna be um, uh, sun. So how is this helping? Well, already there are cities that are gathering data from these dashboards and applying it to real world action. So um, Kyoto is using it for scenario planning. Dublin has already, has already activated a very, um, uh, you know, increase uh, attention towards bicycle usage. And in Houston and Dallas, they're realizing an incredible uh, potential for, for so rooftop solar. The last um, project from Google that I'll share is the Dynamic World. And, and this is one that's in partnership with National Ge Geographic and World Resources Institute. And it is trying to derive a 10 meter land cover data set for the whole planet, which is really pretty incredible. I mean, maybe in, in three years from now, we'll say that it's not so incredible, but right now we just don't have that. And they are, um, utilizing data from Sentinel-2, uh, 10 meter data, but they need to be able to, to classify this by uh, sort of tiered classification of what um, potential land cover is or what land cover is. And so they have um, humans going in and producing uh, um, training data sets to say, you know, this is this type of vegetation, this is um, buildings, et cetera. And then with millions and millions of training data sets, then they're able to use uh, machine learning and AI, and use, I believe they're using TensorFlow to be able to then apply this to classify the Sentinel-2 data. So ultimately in the coming years, I don't even know what the time frame is, 
but um, soon we will have 10 meter land cover data that, um, that can, because the algorithms and the methods that they're producing can't be re reproducible, it can be updated um, regularly. Uh, this is just showing an example of what we currently have. This one is like uh, 300 meter resolution and then uh, the sample would be which much higher, higher resolution. So why does this matter? Well, we have all these, you know, global plans, these things that we want to accomplish at the global level, but what really matters is getting down to the very, very local where action can take place. And that data is just not available. Like in the United States, we might take it for granted that we have, um, we have higher quality, more accessible data, but this is gonna be um, available for the whole world. All right, so I'm not sure if we have time for a little video. Melinda, how are we doing? We are, let's see, we're at four o'clock, so I think we're fine. Uh, okay, so if I can get this to play, um, it'll just be three minutes. Deforestation. Amazon lost. Mangrove forest melting glaciers. Floods are getting more intense. Traditional West African pastoralist lifestyles are being affected. There are communities who are struggling to survive. There's so much going on in the world, but there are so many people wanting to make a difference. So many people enthusiastic about what they do. We are using Google Earth to monitor the forest and the illegal activity in Indonesia. To make remote sensing more equitable and inclusive for everyone. Create virtual tours of sites related to slavery. To bring attention to the health disparities that have affected these marginalized communities during the pandemic. Provide training, tools, and technology that supports indigenous self-determination and environmental stewardship. To create immersive interactive content to improve quality of education in public schools. We are monitoring community levels for pH, turbidity, and polyphon. We are tracking human impacts on global mangrove ecosystems. To generate critical trace to collect knowledge in the Bermuda Amazon region. We are using Google Earth Engine to show people where and when to expect the biggest impact from sea level rise. To estimate the pollution levels in different parts of the economy. To take the world. Virtual driving. The Earth Engine plays an important role to mitigate climate change. We can tell the changes chronologically, and by making a single picture, we are telling the public here is an area that the problem might occur in the future. Fires are having a massive impact on this area. The satellite imagery we source from Google Earth, Google Earth Engine, has really enabled people to extract information that they would never have accessible before. And that really helps us pinpoint where we need to look at on the ground. We have now started partnering with Google to give every hut a unique address. We've been very steadily using Google Plus codes, which can be ingested on Google Maps so that anybody could navigate to that particular house. We are using Google Earth to reclaim and rename our cultural sites to our traditional names. Earth Engine is definitely one of the tools in NASA's toolbox. Running our processes in the cloud and not having to download things, Earth Engine has been a game changer. Okay, thank you, that was all. Okay, thanks so much, Sophia. That was really excellent and good to hear about all of these. Um, about um, the um, deal for good. Thanks. <laughs>